Ah, well, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. SWE is a really hard act to follow. Um, uh, <coughs> fortunately, I'm not going to be talking for a very long time. You know, I'm from Goldman Sachs, and you know, we at Goldman Sachs are really pleased to uh, have the opportunity to partner with H2O. It's a, a wonderful product, it's a wonderful company, a wonderful team, and it's a, really a, a privilege for us to be associated with H2O. So I think you know, Sri ended his talk um, uh, with um, some really thought-provoking ideas, and one of them, you know, darkness versus light. And actually, that's the theme of my talk, you know, the promise and the peril of machine learning in finance. Uh, I'm, uh, so I've worked in machine learning for a long time. I was actually an academic. I was a professor at the University of California before I went to work for Amazon and now for Goldman Sachs. And my team is working on some really exciting applications of machine learning, but um, we have learned lessons, and I've learned lessons previously about um, how to really achieve the promise and how to avoid the peril. So that's um, uh, what I want to talk about today. So um, uh, of course, you know, we're all excited about artificial intelligence. We're excited about machine learning. Um, uh, we're excited about opportunities to use software like H2O to achieve value. Uh, but what's the fundamental reason why people are excited about AI nowadays? Like, like I said, you know, I was working in artificial intelligence literally decades ago when there was a lot of interest among researchers and among academics, but there wasn't much interest in the rest of the world. So what really changed in the last five to 10 years is the arrival of deep learning. And uh, if you have some familiarity with the history of science and philosophy of science, then you know about the idea of uh, normal science and then scientific revolutions. And deep learning in its own way is a scientific revolution in the Kuhnian sense in machine learning, artificial intelligence, computer science. And what I have on the left here is an illustration of what we can do with deep learning that was simply impossible to do previously. So, Here's a rather random picture, a bicycle with a box of donuts. And then there's a question in natural language. How many leftover donuts is the red bicycle holding? And this is actually a training example. So for it's the, because it's a training example, we're given the answer. We're given the label, the ground truth. And the ground truth answer is three. And with deep learning, then we can uh, make a training set of pictures, of questions, and answers. And then the uh, machine learning method can actually learn to answer similar questions for photographs in the future. So deep learning has enabled this wave of progress, especially in computer vision and in natural language re more recently, and in the combination of natural language and vision. And what we've also found is that for many business applications, that deep learning gives us uh, a higher, significantly higher accuracy than any previous methods. I mentioned forecasting here. That's something that my team worked on at Amazon. Uh, it's a very central problem for Amazon. Amazon doesn't want to be out of stock, but doesn't want to be overstocked, and has tens of millions of products that are for sale. And every day, there are thousands of new products that arrive in inventory. And uh, Amazon needs to know how many of these to uh, put in the warehouses so as not to be out of stock, but not to be overstocked either. And Amazon, you know, is using deep learning for forecasting now, and uh, it's a significant improvement over any previous forecasting methods. So deep learning is why people are excited. What is deep learning? Well, deep learning is inspired originally by uh, neuroscience, by the brain. It is the current generation of neural networks. And if you know something about the history of artificial intelligence, well, neural networks actually date from the 1950s. And then in the 1980s, there was a wave of excitement around neural networks because there was um, a significant, um, uh, really a quantum leap in the performance of neural networks with the invention of an algorithm called backpropagation. And uh, neural networks actually have been used very successfully in finance and banking ever since the 1990s. So if you swipe a credit card to make a purchase, then there's real-time fraud monitoring of that uh, transaction. And the fraud monitoring is probably being done by a neural network and has been done by neural networks since the 1990s. And if you 
write a check, a handwritten check, maybe a little old-fashioned these days, well, there's automatic handwriting recognition on the check, uh, and that's done by neural networks and has been done by neural networks since the 1990s. But then in the last five to 10 years, there was this wave of progress, um, uh, and we have new algorithmic ideas, and then we have new computational power from GPUs from the cloud, and so we can do things that we really couldn't do before, like the example I gave of answering questions about images. And then uh, in business in particular, we have massive amounts of data, and traditional statistical methods are really excellent and appropriate when you have smaller data sets, but typically when you have very large data sets, then the statistical methods simply don't extract all the signal that's available in the data, and then if we use uh, machine, modern machine learning methods, then we're extracting more signal from the data. All right. So now I'm going to go from the promise to the peril. What can deep learning not do? And the way I would phrase this is that AI methods now and for the foreseeable development of current methods can't achieve deep understanding. And this is something to keep in mind when you're thinking about a potential application. Um, is your application relatively shallow or does your application really intrinsically require a very deep level of human intelligence. And if we're thinking about applications, if we're trying to be concrete, then we need an operational definition of what it is that we're talking about. So I would say that understanding very concretely, it's the ability to answer questions. And if somebody, a person or a machine, can answer many different questions of many different types and can answer those questions correctly, then you would say that the person or the machine has understanding. And then shallow understanding is the ability to answer a limited range of questions, and the questions are similar to each other. So if it's a credit card transaction fraud detection, then the only question we're really answering is, is this transaction fraudulent? So there's only one type of question, and um, uh, the algorithm can give a pretty accurate answer to um, uh, that question. Although maybe the biggest benefit of using a machine learning method for fraud detection and credit card transactions is that then we can do it in less than 100 milliseconds. We can do it in real time. And if we were using humans, of course, it, would be, it wouldn't be real time and it would be prohibitively expensive. Then now deep understanding is understanding that is multi-layered and that can bring in broad context, broad knowledge. And I'll have an example of that in just a few seconds. And I think an interesting point is that if you look at the etymology of the word intelligence, whether it's in English or any other language that has a similar word, it goes back to the Latin. And in Latin, intelligere means to select between. So um, you know, even the, the Romans, uh, I think, understood that you know, intelligence was really the ability to select between answers to a question. So, uh, let me go back to this example of the donuts on the bicycle and uh, a story. The first time that I used this um, image in a presentation, it was actually for the Amazon Board of Directors. So Jeff Bezos is uh, very knowledgeable about machine learning, but not everybody on the Amazon Board of Directors is uh, really nearly as knowledgeable. So I was asked to uh, make a presentation and to really provide some education for the Amazon directors about what is machine learning. And so I used this as an example. And uh, you know, if you look at this picture and the question is how many leftover donuts, well, yeah, three. But then something really interesting happened. Um, uh, I had this picture up. I showed that the answer was three, and Jeff Bezos put his hand up. And he said, no, the answer is not three. The answer is three and a half. And indeed, if you look closely at the picture, then in the donut box in the lower right, you can see a half-eaten donut peeking out. So yes, so from one point of view, the answer is three. From another point of view, the answer is three and a half. And then actually, you don't literally see another half donut. Instead, what you can see in the picture is two pieces of a donut. So there's really three different answers to this question, three different correct answers. And then I'd say that deep understanding is the ability to then explain why each of these answers is correct 
depending on your point of view, depending on the purpose for which the question is being asked. So if the real purpose of the question is how many additional people can we feed, then the answer would be three because nobody wants to eat somebody else's half-eaten donut. And if the question is simply what is visible in the image, it's three and two pieces. But as humans, we understand about gravity. We know that if there were just two pieces of donut floating in the air, they wouldn't stay floating in the air. They would fall down, and then they would be hidden by the side of the box. So by adding some reasoning to what we can actually see, and we add this reasoning in a very unconscious way, we get the answer, yeah, there's a half donut. We know that those two pieces are connected. So this is an example of what I would call deep understanding. And um, uh, there's progress in machine learning that um, uh, you know, there's certainly a lot of research attempts to add common sense, to add knowledge about causality. But uh, that progress is um, perhaps not yet ready for easy use in applications. Uh, so there are a lot of consequences of shallow understanding, which one big consequence is called brittleness by AI researchers. And this is something which was very well understood you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, even with the previous generation of AI methods. Uh, so uh, an application is brittle when it um, has a tendency to fail in ways that a human would really not, not fail in the same way. So as an example, um, not to pick on Amazon, but uh, if you have an Alexa device, then you can ask it the question, Alexa, how high is Mount Everest? And you'll get a good answer, a uh, sentence, and it says 29,000, 29 feet. But then if you follow up with something which would be very simple and easy for a human, Alexa, where is it located? Well, the last time I actually tried this was a couple of months ago, and uh, it gave me an answer. The address is such and such, the 318 Third Avenue. So um, uh, somehow it, uh, you know, it thought, you know, that's too anthropomorphic, but um, instead of giving me the location of Mount Everest, it gave me the location of a restaurant which has the word Everest in its name. So there was a lack of genuine understanding. And uh, you can easily find similar failures in um, any natural language system or even any computer vision system where if you ask questions of too many different types, then you quickly find that there's a lack of common sense, there's a lack of deep understanding. And then another consequence of um, uh, the lack of deep understanding is that AI systems tend to need excessive quantities of training examples compared to what a human would need to learn to perform a similar task. So uh, you know, if you haven't been in Boston, then you may not know that there's a regional usage of the word wicked, which really is an intensifier. Um, uh, like uh, It's wicked cold outside. And if you don't know this use of the word wicked, you just go to Boston, you just have to hear people say it once or twice, and as a human, you figure out what it means. But uh, machine learning systems need enormous quantities of training examples. You know, if you're a human and you're learning to drive, well, maybe as a child, you've spent a couple thousand hours being driven around, and then you do 10 or 20 hours of practice driving by yourself, and then you more or less know how to drive. You may not be a very good driver, but you know how to drive. And, um, uh, but self-driving cars are trained with a minimum of millions of hours of video, and then they still um, uh, make, have failures that, would, um, that a human wouldn't fall into the same trap. All right, uh, so that was the peril of machine learning and AI, so what about the promise? So, uh, let me give you an example of something which I think is a really wonderful application of natural language which uh, avoids the uh, perils of these applications. And this just happens to be a company that Goldman Sachs is also an investor in, but I didn't choose it for that reason. Um, I heard about it and thought it was you know, very clever um, even before Goldman Sachs invested in it. So this company is called 98.6, and they want to increase the productivity of primary care physicians and other practitioners in medicine. So this is an important social need. Uh, and so how does it work? It's an app, and the patient describes his or her symptoms in free text, 
And then the app uses machine learning, natural language pro processing uh, to analyze the patient responses. And then the app asks follow-on questions. And the follow-on questions come from a bank of questions that have been carefully written by humans to be unambiguous but open-ended to prompt um, informative answers from patients. And then the patient answers the follow-on questions. And then once the um, patient has done this interview, then the questions and the answers are given to the human practitioner. And the human can read these questions and answers and understand them much quicker than the human could actually do the interview with the patient. And so the physician reads the answers, meets the patient, and as needed, the physician can ask more questions and collect more information. So if what the patient had already said and the answers the patient had already given were enough, then the physician can be very quick and make a diagnosis, write a prescription, whatever the next steps are. But if the machine learning natural language processing has actually failed and has asked the wrong questions, then the human practitioner can ask the right questions. So the deep understanding is only needed in the human. The deep understanding is not needed in the machine learning and the natural language processing. But then the shallow understanding is very helpful for increasing the productivity of the human. And uh, this company um, uh, now offers actually primary care visits with um, uh, board certified physicians for a cost of only $1, 24 seven. Um, and the average length of time for the practitioner has gone down from something like 25 minutes to nine minutes. So this is almost a three X productivity improvement for the humans. And the company collects some um, satisfaction scores from patients after every patient visit and also satisfaction scores from the physicians and those satisfaction scores are the same or higher when the productivity has gone from is nine minutes as opposed to previously at 25 minutes. Because actually this is more satisfying for the physicians. They get to spend more time doing what they like doing and really using their education, which is diagnosis, and they have to spend less time on the more routine early part of the visit. So I think this is a great example of using machine learning natural language processing in a, in a well-designed, targeted way to improve productivity. All right, so I'm mostly running out of time. I have a few slides about machine learning, specifically in finance. Maybe let me just move to uh, this slide, which is very relevant in finance, but also in other application areas, and I think quite consistent with what Sri was saying in his talk. So how do you drive a project that uses machine learning? And you know, my experience and the experience of many people that I've talked to is that you really need someone to be the product manager. And you don't necessarily need somebody whose job title is product manager, who is only the product manager. You know, maybe the data scientist is also the product manager. But product management is really the product manager is the voice of the customer towards the developer and then the voice of the developer towards the customer. So the product manager is telling the users what is feasible, and then the product manager is telling the developers what is really useful to the users. So some of the things that a product manager does, um, quantify the size of the business opportunity, understand exactly what would be useful for the stakeholders, and then if you have a machine learning project, uh, what I wrote in blue here, is uh, things that are different about machine learning projects or things that are more important about machine learning projects. So especially in a machine learning project, you, it's, very, it's crucial to figure out exactly what metrics should be maximized. And there was a good example of this in Sri's talk when he mentioned you know, maximizing the number of positives in the top 10%. So let's say that you have a lot of prospects for marketing and you only have resources to contact 10% of your prospects, then the particular metric that you want to maximize is how many good prospects are within the top 10%. And that's a different metric from other p potential metrics like precision and recall. It's very specialized to the application. And that, uh, my experience in machine learning applications, it's 
really crucial to figure out exactly what metrics you want to maximize. Because the machine learning method doesn't really have deep intelligence. So it's going to maximize the metric, even if it's the wrong metric. And so you as a human need to know what is the right metric. Then understand which data is useful, find the data, evaluate its quality. Um, uh, you know, often access to data and quality of data is the bottleneck or the weak link in the chain. Design how the new system fits into existing systems. This is certainly important in any large organization that has legacy software. Um, uh, the new application has to fit into the existing applications. Then quantify latency, volume, and other system needs. You know, if you're doing credit card transaction fraud detection, has to be less than 100 milliseconds, has to be 1,000 transactions per second, whatever. Design the user interface design guardrails and monitoring. So we were hearing at the end of Sri's talk about uh, you know, monitoring whether the distribution of the features in your data in production is similar to the distribution of features uh, in the training data. All right, I've gone over time, so I'm going to stop here. Um, uh, and uh, questions are, are very welcome if we have time for questions. And I'll be around here during the day so people can catch me also. Thank you.